Three years later, I am 15 years old. My birthday's in the spring. Three years from now, the starting village arc will end. After three more years of hard work, the goddess will transport me back to my world, probably. It better be it. Goddess, why don't you show your face yet? The silence is too cruel. What's going on? Although Granny Marie had prayed for the goddess to appear, she did not pay us a visit. On the contrary, it feels strange she never contacted us. What does it mean? Oh, can it be? No way. Is it possible she's in a situation where she can't keep in touch with us? Is she in trouble? Can something unforeseen have happened to her? I shudder. No, no, no. No way. There's nothing else I can do here but wait for her contact. I'll just complain, I mean, pray whenever I'm at the church. That way, I can be reached as soon as possible. After hearing the goddess's message to Marie, I visit the church most weekends, except when I have business at home. One reason is so I can consult with Marie about future events, along with confirming and reporting the current situation to her. To see if the goddess has responded. Secondly, Marie offered me a spare room dedicated as my research and materials storage area, for the sake of developing technology toward the village's defense. Naturally, the room is lockable and comes with a key. Both have been replaced recently, too. I have also linked a handmade security device, so that no one besides me can enter the room. Well, in theory that's the case. Finally, I can store materials and completed devices free from prying eyes. Back at the Lord's Mansion, I've no privacy or a secure place to call my own. The butler and maids have master keys and can pretty much enter any room. Another reason I visit the church so often is because of Leon's elder brother. He chases me to no end that it's hard to relax. These days, his hand that frequently strokes my head has migrated to touching my shoulders and face back and waist. It's frightening. I'm being touched so freely. It feels like I'm encountering perverts even at home. It's the worst. I can't even report it since we're related. Because of all this, I feel safe at the church. I have Marie as my ally, and I've already won over the orphans. It's because I bring a box of confectionery each time, filled with donuts, cakes, and cream puffs that the children love. I've done my research. There's no mistake, these are the favorites. As such, the kids are now absolutely obedient to my words. I've strictly informed them not to tell anyone, especially Alfred, I'm there during the weekends. The job I was given by the goddess is supposed to be kept secret. I've told them that if they break the promise, the goddess will punish them severely. Basically, it's the carrot and stick method. In the dead of night, the goddess will appear at your bedside dripping with blood, when I added a touch of movie-like horror to my warning, everyone looked like they were about to cry. I felt bad about it, but there is no denying that the effects were immediate. I also said, if you kids run your mouth to Alfred, then I'll never bring sweets over again. Honestly, I think that one was more effective than the scare tactics. However, these are children so I worried if they could do it. Though they seem to be fulfilling the part of the bargain so far. Every time I go to the church, they immediately tell me they've done as I asked, looking proud of themselves. When I praise them for it, they get so happy. I don't really get it, but they look like they're having fun. Well, kids love secret missions, just secret things in general. They're all orphans here, but the spirited and smiling, a bunch of cheerful and good children. The way the gentle Granny Marie, though at times strict, raises them with love may have something to do with it. Whenever I take a break and play with them, they always get so happy. It's really soothing, wiping clean the daily buildup of stress. Alfred heads out early in the morning on weekends for his part-time job and doesn't return home until late at night. Very rarely does he get a half-day or a holiday break. I have his schedule memorized because both Marie and the children taught it to me. Because I've confirmed this information before starting my weekly visits to the church, I never bumped into him, and therefore am spending my time peacefully. Though I sometimes encounter the villagers elderly, they seem to think that whenever I'm worried about something I'll go to the church. Every now and then, they would approach me with a kind expression and say if I keep praying and do my best, eventually the goddess will answer my call. Well, since the villagers are busy with farming and living out their lives, they don't often pay the church a visit so it doesn't really matter if they know I'm going there or not. For that reason, I spend my entire weekends at the church. Saturday rolls by. According to the kids and Marie's, Al's part-time job schedule report, he'll be at work all day and has been gone since the morning. All right. 
This is great because I can't go to the church unless he's away. Today's bribes are the newly released triple chocolate scone and red berry and blueberry scone. I bought it at a delicious and famous bakery yesterday while coming home from school. The fluffy and have just the right touch of sweetness. I'm fond of them as well and purchase them occasionally. The kids will definitely dig it. In high spirits, I leave the residence with my luggage, skipping on the way. The butler thinks I'm heading to the library for some independent study. It's obviously a lie, but there's no one to doubt or confirm it. Leon's family is apathetic to everyone besides themselves. I don't know if they practice the principles of laissez-faire, or are just a family of egotists. His father is often at work, his mother is busy chasing the kingdom's latest beauty and fashion trends, and his brother sometimes shadows his father for the day to learn the ropes as his successor, but mostly just goes out and about in town to play. Craning my neck, I take in the warm sun and crisp blue sky. A few white clouds float over the horizon. It's a bit dizzying. I drop my head and try to shake off the feeling. Maybe I'm mentally drained. I did leave the school late at night after doing my homework, preparing for the next lesson, and working on the alarm devices for the village. So far, I've created the first prototype and tried testing it with a mouse-type demon I caught past the village's borders. The risk of getting injured from a small demon is low. If you don't attack first, they won't bother you. Even so, they'll target the crops, so the farmlands will sustain a ton of damage if I don't do anything. It seems these mouse-type demons wreak havoc every so often. The alarm device senses the mouse-type demon and blares. For now, it's a success. The fruits of my hard labor. I sacrificed so much sleep for this and worked myself half to death. However, even though sleep is precious, increasing the village's defense as soon as possible is crucial as well. I also need to make several of these devices. Only one won't cut it. I plan to expand the search range, increase the alarm's volume, and add an electric barrier to the second prototype. I'll call it, Alarm No. 2. Electric Execution. By the time I reach No. 5, I should be close to something with practical use. Another thing on my list is drawing up a map of the village and marking the areas where demons will strike. Then I'll have to distribute them to the villages as a disaster prevention measure. As long as I designate a few evacuation centers on the map, people should head there in times of need. It'll be a good idea to litter the perimeter of these shelters with demon traps and barrier devices. For these countermeasures to last a full night is my current goal. The demons appear to be weak against daylight, movement slowing into a trudge as soon as the sun rises, and as such giving the villagers an opportunity to escape. I sigh. This is not the time to be feeling dizzy. I have to get it together. I can't be collapsing now. There's still a long list of things waiting for me to check off. A whole mountain load of them. As usual, Marie greets me with a smile after I knock on the church's doors, her cheeks reminiscent of apples. Welcome, Leanne Sama. He he. The children have been loitering around as they eagerly waited for you. Hello, Marie. Ha ha. Is that so? Yep. Well, it must be because I'm always bringing goodies along. Sugar is very expensive in these parts. Unfortunately, this country doesn't produce sugar. Since sugar canes only grow in tropical climates, we won't be able to make any sugar even if we try. For this reason, we have to rely on pricey imports from the south, which drives up the prices of confectionery. Kids don't normally get a chance to taste them, let alone eat them every week. Similarly, in my original world, the general public can't eat frivolously. Noticing my presence, several kids that are playing in the courtyard rush toward me. Ah, it's Leanne Sama. Leanne Sama. Hooray. Leanne Sama is here. Hello, I say. Looks like everyone's doing fine today. Him. It's good to be healthy. The kids burst into laughter. The little shorty's cheeks flush pink, shy smiles showing on their lips. Three little kids tug on the hem of my spring coat. All three sport a head full of brown curls, the one on the right with red eyes, the one in the middle yellow, and green on the left. According to Marie, from right to left is the elder brother, elder sister, and youngest sister, but to me, they're indistinguishable. Leanne Sama, P. Way. P. Way with. Come P. Way. Sure. In a little bit. I pat each of their heads, and they each flash me a bright smile. Oh, so cute. I feel sued. Now, now. Leanne Sama is a busy person, so don't pester him, okay. The kids say in chorus, okay, looking a little disappointed, and begin to run back. See you later, Leanne Sama. 
later. Yes, yes. I wave my hand and see them off into the garden. Whenever I come here, it's always lively. Totally different from the deathly silence of Leon's mansion. I hand the paper bag with the scones to Marie. Today's tea desserts are scones. Here you go. Oh my. What a delicious scent. Thank you as always. But even if you don't care about such things, is it really okay for you to spend so much money on the kids? It's not a problem. Especially since you're letting me use that room. Besides, I'm just buying what I want to eat, so don't worry about it. As I smile, Marie laughs and her cheeks die red. Is that so? Then I will serve some delicious tea. Great. I can't wait to try it. Yes. Please look forward to it. I'll be working on some documents on the first floor, so if you need anything, please call out. I'll be able to hear it from the stairs. Okay. Tea will be served at noon. Thank you very much. I bring the lunch and Marie brings the tea. Although in the past she has told me that she would prepare lunch as well, I don't want to be too indebted to her. I'd be an idiot to have the church pay for my food expenses every weekend. Waving goodbye to Marie, I climb the stairs to the second floor, heading for the laboratory at the back. I place my hand on top of the identity scanner, a transparent stone fitted in the center of a small box made of waterproof wood, pouring magic into it until it glows a faint orange. Even in a world like this where the concept of electricity and batteries do not exist, there are some fundamental rules that cross over. For example, appliances need energy in order to perform their intended function. In that same regard, magical products require magic in order to work in this world. Well, that's only natural. That's only natural but, since you were making a fantasy world of sword and magic, you should have made it more fantastical, goddess. I wanted a more mystical feeling than this. I sigh after finishing three alarm number twos. Despite being the size of my palm, they're highly efficient and pack a huge punch, in my opinion. Read this at perpetualdaydreams.com. All of a sudden, my vision goes dark. The dizziness fades away immediately, but my head feels as heavy as lead. Perhaps it's because I kept on using magic and now I've used too much. My body's still slightly shaking, the symptoms similar to donating too much blood. I guess I should take a break for now, get some of that tea Marie's brewing. Pushing against the desk's surface, I slowly rise to my feet, body swaying in the process. However, the feeling of falling flat on my face subsides once I stop moving, so I'm able to leave the room. I was fine until then. However, when I reach the bottom of the stairs, my legs give in and I'm forced to sit down. No good. My blood, I mean, my magic power has been drained. I can't move. Try as I might, I can't push myself to my feet, the limbs heavy and lame. It's useless. I can't even twitch my fingers. It can't be helped. Let's just rest a bit like this. Maybe after a while I'll be back to normal. I lean against the wall and shut my eyes. Hey, are you okay? What the? For some reason, this voice sounds familiar. No, no way. That guy should be at his part-time job by now. He's definitely not here. Hello. Pull yourself together. He shakes my shoulders. Hey. Why? How? No, it can't be. I've already confirmed his schedule. He's supposed to be working all day. That's what I originally thought, but... As soon as my heavy eyelids flit open, I'm greeted by the sight of familiar and bright golden strands. Symmetrical face. Furrowed brows. It's Alfred. I cry out in surprise. Why is he here? Breaking free of shock, I try to shrink away but my back hits the wall. My head smacks into the hard surface, making me even dizzier. H. Hey. You okay? What's going on with you? Are you not feeling well? W. What are you doing here? Me. Oh, during my part-time job, the grandpa who was repairing the roof with me slipped. I tried to save him and ended up falling and breaking my arm. Ha. Huh. Anyway, he's fine so I'm happy. He told me to go see the doctor and take the day off. So here I am. For some reason, the fact that he can just say this with not a care in the world makes me upset. Why you broke your arm? Upon closer inspection, there are bandages wrapped tightly around his left arm. T that's right. I I have a top class recovery item. W wait a second, I'll give, I mean, let you use it. It's not strong enough to mend bone, but it can temporarily reinforce it. Not to mention, offer some pain relief. As I thrust a hand into my jacket pocket, he suddenly restrains my arm. No need. Dr. Kumar already set the bone a while ago. 
As long as I don't move it around too much, it should heal without an issue. I is that so. Recovery items aren't some sort of panacea. There are things they can't heal. For example, broken bones. However, there are more powerful remedies that can deal with serious injuries. Just be sure to dish out a lot of cash in that case. The common masses. Don't even dream of getting your hands on it. Even the ones with deep pockets can't buy these remedies whenever they want. That's why, there are people like Dr. Kuma, who can set bones without the help of these overpriced items. That's impossible to do unless one studies medicine and magic technique. Won't it be better if you use it instead of me? Alfred retorts. Me. No, I don't need it. Really. But your face, it's really pale. Is that true? I don't really know. No worries. It'll be back to normal after I rest. Even after my words, Alfred's brows remain crinkled. Why's that? It's just magic deficiency. It's almost the same as having anemia. As such, recovery items can't offer any relief. Should I bring you to DR? Kuma. That's not necessary, I say, shaking my head. It'll be a pain to explain everything to him. Well then, do you want me to take you home? No, I don't want that. I don't want to go back. I've already told everyone at home I'll be going to the library. If they see Alfred taking me home, that'll just raise too many questions. And I don't have the patience to deal with that. Alfred sports an unusually troubled expression. He lets out a sigh. Then stay put at least. You shouldn't even walk to the living room. Yes, yes. I'll stay right here. I should probably be better after resting a bit. Quickly return to your room. Don't forget, you're injured too. I don't mind if you leave me alone. I can't leave you collapsed in such a place. Grasping my arm, he lends a shoulder to me to hold on to, but I shake it off. Anyway, I just want you to quickly leave already. It's too much of a hassle to elaborate any further. My head's spinning and my body doesn't move the way I want it to. I don't think I can successfully deceive him the way I am right now. Oh, that's right. I need to spin a good story to Alfred explaining why I'm here. What's a good excuse? My father asked me to check and confirm if the church's management has improved. I see. It's fine if you don't talk anymore. With great effort, I turn my head but am stopped short of a full round. Alfred's hand rests on my forehead, holding it in place. You don't have a fever. On the contrary, isn't your temperature too low? It's really cold, hey, are you sure you're okay? I think it's better to bring you to the doctor after all. I'm not going. Leave me alone already. As soon as I shout, Alfred's face grows sullen. His glare is sharp enough to cut. Ah, looks like he hates me now. Well, since he's disliked me in the past, it shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? Anyway, I have to be disliked, so this should be fine, right? Indeed. That's correct. To be hated is part of my role. So, why am I shocked about this? Yelling has made my head grow even dizzier. I don't feel good. I feel nauseous. I don't want to see Alfred's face. I want him to go away. In any case, you hate me, don't you? I know at least that much. Go to your room. I say this, but Alfred stubbornly crouches before me, giving no hint of leaving any time soon. He's pouting, brows furrowed and deep in thought. Could it be, magic deficiency? He whispers. In the past, Alfred suffered from an illness due to an opposite underlying cause. Unlike his, mine was the result of magic overuse. I wonder if I can transfer magic to you. He's still muttering something to himself. Magic transfer. As the name implies, this is the transfer of magic power from one person to another. However, there's no guaranteed success. If the magic between the two is not compatible, the act will cause more harm than good. In that regard, it's like a blood transfusion. You'll feel pain and discomfort if a rejection occurs. During that lesson in our intermediate magic technique class, I tried performing a magic transfer with a classmate. I ended up doubling over with pain and felt ill afterward. That was seriously an awful lesson. Thus, I shake my head to his suggestion. No need. You're injured. Anyway, I'll be better in a flash. Ms. Marie and the children will worry about you if you do, and me too. I'll also be worried. Why are you always hurt? You know you're injured but you hesitate to go to the hospital, opting to let it heal on its own because of your financial status. Well, it seems to work due to your miraculous resilience as the future hero. Somehow, I managed to move my arms and thrust the recovery item into his breast pocket. I have an extra, so I'll give this to you. 
Be grateful. Oh, you don't have to worry. Unlike you, I'm rich. I have a ton at home and they'll just rot if no one uses them. Just accept it, you forever injured person. Alfred looks at his breast pocket, then turns his attention to me. He's expressionless. As expected, I don't have a clue what he's thinking. Out of nowhere, he rolls up my sleeve and grabs hold of my wrist. The place where his skin meets mine gradually grows warmer. It's like a hot compress. No way. Does it hurt? Does it feel uncomfortable? What are you doing? It hurts. No, it doesn't hurt but, you. Are you feeling sick? No, but. Then, it's fine. What's going on? Him. Like the professor said, the transfer of magic through the skin takes too long, says Alfred. And the amount is not enough. The sun's about to set. He looks at me. What? What are you looking at? He says, I wonder if through the mucous membranes is the quickest way after all. Stop it. He's not wrong. There should be an emergency procedure like that. Artificial respiration. He grasps my chin. I want to put a stop to it but my body doesn't move. And our lips meet. I feel something warm flow into my mouth. It's kind of like when you drink sake. Then Alfred tilts his face back slightly, breaking into a smile. Looks like we're compatible. In such a case, the magic powers mix well, permeating and blending with the body, giving both parties an intoxicating, pleasurable sensation. When the professor had lectured about magic transfusions in class, he smiled like a criminal during that section. There's no mistake about it. Perverted geezer confirmed. He also said it's because that partner will also be compatible with you at night. But that information is unnecessary. I'm fine now so, Alpha. He presses his mouth against mine once more. This time, there's a burst of warmth. NNGH. It's as though warm sake is being poured into my mouth mercilessly, in an endless fashion. A terrible wave of intoxication crashes into me. Like a fever that's difficult to control, it flows into me, crushing all hopes of resisting. It enters in large quantities, swirling and coiling within the body at its own convenience. That said, my body does not reject it. In fact, it gobbles it up like a dehydrated man in the face of water. I know that this is just the start, this act of greedily absorbing. I know this, but my body feels so hot and painful. Furthermore, my head is spinning and burning up. Sweat flows down my skin like a waterfall. It's hot, so hot. Trembles run through my entire body. I want it to stop. I'm already at my limit. It's impossible to receive any more. I can't accept anything beyond this. It's overflowing. I've had enough. It has completely exceeded my capacity. It's too hot and it hurts. What is this? I really don't know. But why is there pleasure mixed in with the pain? Although the strength of the exchange is slowly waning, I still can't control my body. There is nothing I can do. The lips that press against mine retreat. Opening my eyes, I'm greeted by trembling blue orbs, orbs that peer down at me. I fall forward. With a face painted with surprise, Alfred hurriedly throws his arms around me to support me. I'm being held. Why does his body seem bigger than mine? When did he grow bigger? I really can't move my body, so I decide to just stay like this. After confirming my dazed condition, Alfred opens his eyes curiously and tilts his head. This bastard. What did you do? I can no longer raise my arms. I can't even twitch a single finger. Huh. How strange. And here I thought the magic transfer was working fine. Even though I'm completely exhausted, I managed to open my mouth. You, should learn, some moderation. Moderation. You, transferred, too much, every person has a set amount of magic they can hold in the body. Pass that, and it will overflow, causing one to collapse. Kind of like what's happening to me right now. Muttering to himself, Alfred nods as though he understands what I said. Sorry. I see, so I gave you too much magic power. Him. This moderation thing is harder than I thought. That's just you. Your magic capacity is just too strange. Besides, why did he use this method? That shitty geezer said the mucous membrane contact method should only be used in emergencies. So why did he do it? Not only that, but why does he seem unconcerned about it? What's he thinking? Is he screwing around? That bastard's so calm after kissing me. No 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 no. You, idiot, fool, I can't believe you. My bad. However, your temperature's gone back to normal. Before, you were way too cold. Like a block of ice. Ah, but now you're too hot. Him. I'm not sure, I should take you to DR. 
Kuma after all. I'm not going. I summoned all of my energy to vehemently refuse. Alfred releases a sigh. I'm fine, I just need to, lay down for a bit, and sleep. Are you positive? I nod. I've relaxed a little and as long as I keep still, the heat circulating my body should calm down. Understood. As soon as the words leave his lips, he scoops one hand under my knees and tosses me over his shoulder. His body is as ridiculously strong as ever. However, his way of holding me is too forceful. Plus, the blood's all flowing to my head. Oh, my vision's growing dark. Meanwhile, Alfred's climbing the stairs without a clue in the world about my current condition. Where are you taking me? Cut it out already. Despite having more complaints, I can't sustain my consciousness any longer. My last thought was whether he could finish carrying me up the stairs. I wake up to an unfamiliar room. Dreary and slightly unpleasant, containing only the bare minimum. After scanning the area, I realize Alfred's not present. I place a hand on my chest, gently stroke it. Perhaps if he was here, I'd be too anxious and won't be able to act out Leon's role. He's really unbelievable. That guy totally lacks common sense. If I'd known this was going to happen, I should have kissed one of my fangirls first. I'm going to cry. No, it's not the same. Right, that kiss didn't count. It was a life-saving procedure, so it doesn't count. That's right. That perverted old geezer said it's an emergency procedure, so. It definitely doesn't count. All right. Finally in a better mood, I climb out of the bed. I tiptoe to the door to the living room, cracking it open just a little. Soft streams of light flow into the room. Marie sits at the table alone, scribbling on some documents. The children are nowhere in sight. Neither is Alfred. When she looks up, her face morphs into the picture of surprise. The pen drops from her hand, the sound of impact echoing throughout the room. Oh my. Leanne Sama. Are you feeling better already? After hearing that you collapsed, I was seriously worried. I'm so sorry, I should have paid attention. And no, that was all my fault. You didn't do anything wrong, Marie. Besides, I'm fine now. So please don't worry too much. You say this but, the look of concern remains. Are you sure you're feeling better? Yes. Sorry to worry you. It's fine, it's fine. It's good as long as you're okay. I feel like a weight has been lifted from my chest, says Ms. Marie, placing her hands on top of her heart, a look of pure relief painted on her face. Anyway, W where is Alfred? Alfred. He's offered his night shift. I told him to take a break yesterday, but it looks like he didn't listen. What a troublesome child. I is that so. Thank goodness. Now that it's mentioned, I recall seeing this revision on, Al's part-time job schedule report. His shifts at a night bar. A. Didn't he just break his arm? Is he an idiot? What is he thinking? No, wait, it's better like this. Now I don't have to see him. I don't think I'll be able to meet his eyes if he was here. You um, excuse me Marie. I should really head home soon. Oh my, is that so? Maybe you should rest more first. Aye, it's fine. The sun's already set. Sure enough, it's pitch black outside. Looks like I was out cold for a while. Probably slept soundly for half a day. Hey, hey, I really slept too much. After a moment of contemplation, Marie agrees with my decision. Please take care of yourself. And please give yourself a break occasionally. Lately, you've been looking very tired. Hey, ah really? Yeah, you've been working too hard. It makes me worried about you. Please don't push yourself so much. T that's kind of. It's true. Please take it easy tomorrow. The body needs an occasional break. You'll collapse if you work without rest. Puffing her cheeks, Marie points a small finger at me. Despite its size, the strength of its push was surprising. S sorry. He he. Oh yeah, you're welcome to come by any day. You don't have to limit yourself to the weekend. As long as you say it's for worship, even Al won't think it's strange. This church is open to the public after all. Why yes, although I feel emotional from what she said, I managed to hold in my tears. Please don't issue a surprise attack of such kind words. Otherwise, I won't know what to do. My head is clear on the way home. Moreover, my body no longer feels heavy. Perhaps it's due to sleeping half a day. Well, I have been pulling all-nighters for a while now. Plus pouring so much magic power into those alarm number twos was a bad idea. Memories of what happened after would come back, and my brain shuts down. Forget it. It was a life-saving procedure. Even Alfred should think of it that way as well. Yep. Anyway, sleep is important. 
From now on, let's moderate how late I'll stay up. Monday morning. As I'm chatting with the three bullies, Alfred enters. The moment he sees me, he heads straight in my direction. Stuck in the classroom, a public space, I can't escape in the opposite direction. I'm stuck watching him come closer and closer, dread sinking in as I kick up a cold sweat. He's here. I'm begging you, please. Don't come over here. Hey, he says. W what? Have you gotten better? A. I I don't know what you're talking about. He arches a brow. I wait for his reply, heart thrashing against my chest. If he's going to go on about what happened Saturday, I'll just deny everything. That's right, wash it away without a trace. Oh, was there such a thing? I don't remember anything. I feel like that's the best tactic. So, ready when you are. I'll skillfully cut through his words. Simulations of every possible path our conversation can take zip through my mind, unfortunately, all of them lack substance. It was really anxiety-inducing. That's why I say I suck at Adlib and irregular development. Save me, Koikiro. You. W what is it? Oh, class is starting. How about you get to your seat? That's right. I'm rushing to my desk. So, scurry off to yours too. As he watches me, Alfred lets out a large sigh. What the heck? Such a rude guy. He actually sighed in front of someone's face. Well, as long as you're fine. You thought correctly. I am totally fine, thanks to your help, I mutter the last part. He did help me, so of course I'm grateful. It's just that the method he used was the worst. Once the words leave my lips, no matter how soft they were, the corners of Alfred's mouth lift. Why is he smiling like that? Like he's teasing me. That's my trademark. You're not allowed to steal it. In the blink of an eye, he draws close to my face. Quote dot dot. If you're running low on magic again, let me know. I sputter. W what are you saying? Just go sit down in your seat. The three lackeys step between me and Alfred, forming a wall. I'm saved. Never have I thought there'll be a day I'll depend on them so much. That's right, what are you getting so close to Leanne Sama for? This poor person really has guts. You don't have permission to approach him. That's right, that's right. Shrugging, Alfred returns to his seat with a laugh. I say, why are you the one acting like the bully? That's my role. Damn it. I'll make you pay during the afternoon sword lesson. I'll wear you down until you can't stand. Just you wait. Translated by Sleepchaser. TLCED by Chiazaholic.